Okay, so let's look at components a little bit. Um, you said you had 10. Clearly, you didn't bring all 10 with you. Thank I didn't goodness. bring all so 10. We'd never be walking out of here. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Where did you start? What was the... Did you have something in mind that was, oh, I'm going to have a oatmeal stout as, as my foundation or a barley wine as my foundation or... Well, I think I, we knew originally that it was going to be barley wine class beer. When I say barley wine, really that's a strong beer above 10%. Um, in England, you may say a strong beer over 8%. So it doesn't have to be, you know, knocked down strong, but it's typically these beers with higher alcohol have a longer shelf stability. Um, you know, a lot of people like to lay these strong beers down and let them develop flavors. And it was an English tradition to brew a barley wine for special occasions. And hmm. so we started out, we had a couple of barley wines that we brewed. The first one we named Abacus, mm -hmm. and it later took on a life of its own, and we've released it now. Uh, on Is it its released own. as Abacus? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I remember that one. In the and uh, another one that's been become a component of almost every single beer is a beer called Bravo. I think we've only missed it maybe once or twice. Okay. And Bravo, I mean, we call it an imperial brown ale, but it still would be under a larger umbrella of barley wine. And sometimes it's hard to explain beer styles because there are these kind of larger categories and subcategories. Wines a little bit, I suppose, too, and the, right? Yeah, Which the Brewers Association recognizes over 85 different styles, and there's typically two or three subcategories within, within style. So it gets pretty complicated. And it's, you know, I suppose that wine has the advantage that as you use a grape, you kind of help corral sure. these things in. But, um, and I brought some raw materials with me. So the, the beer that I'm going to pour for you here is Bravo Brown. And this is something that hasn't been released on its own, um, but has been one of the major players and um, one of my favorites so far uh, in the program. And, you know, you look at it, yes, it has a brown color. It is carbonated and has a nice uh, off-white foam. And, you know, this has been in a bourbon barrel for at least a year, and it, it you know, it has bourbon elements. It's kind of like toffee to me, right? Toffee flavor is like really, really rich. But I think um, if you gave, I think people that have this idea that they don't like beer probably haven't they? tasted things like this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've met I enjoy that them. challenge. And so, you know, this kind of transcends beer and, and leads somewhere closer to wine, somewhere in the spirits world. It kind of like is in that middle ground. A cup of coffee almost. <laughs> <laughs> but... So, also a sweetness to it, which which a lot of people would like, I suppose, that don't like the your regular fare. Yeah, and so you know. So this you, is bur old bourbon barrel, hundred percent in the bourbon barrel, um, one year in bourbon barrel. In fact, probably closer to fourteen months. And what we typically see when we make these beers, um, they're coming from the brew house. We're taking these raw materials, and I brought some. And you know, here's here's some base barley. And if we chew a little bit of that barley. Which I have been eating this though. I mean, of course it doesn't taste anything like the beer that we're going to make because this is like a little capsule of, of capsule of starch. And so we have a, a different starting material. It's a long chain carbohydrate. We're gonna have to break it down into sugars. We can add other things to it. In this case, we added some dark malt to it mm. to give it some color this and some really roasty character. Been nibbling on this yeah. while we've been sitting here. And then obviously there's hops in this particular brew, but you know, so we have a whole palette of different materials to add. Um, yes, there's season to season variability. Yes, there's different suppliers who can produce different flavors. So we have to kind of play that game, but we can count on those materials year in and year out. So I can make the base of this beer very similar every, every vintage, year. so to speak. That's interesting, yeah, because you're not quite so affected as we are in the wine business with what the weather gives you. I guess you're probably affected more by availability of product than you are by quality of product, mm -hmm. I would think. Yeah, so, you know, for a brewery that's growing like ourselves, we kind of have to stay ahead of the curve mm -hmm. and make sure that we're in good contact with the farmers, with the suppliers, oh. and letting them know how much raw material we're going to need in a given year. Last year, we had a, a kind of a, a horrific barley crop in Canada. It didn't result in bad flavor. It just had bad manageability in the brewery. It, it, the, the grain wasn't behaving well. So, you know, we have what we call high beta glucan, which resulted in sticky mashes and bad filtrations oh, wow. and all sorts of 
issues that we learned how to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, but I mean, back to this beer. To me, it's 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 almost a perfect base beer for what we're talking about blending of beers because this isn't hop driven. You're not dealing with a lot of fragile high aromatics. You really like you you said it's got this sweet toffee middle, and it's something that's great to build upon. I don't know what the equivalent in the wine world would be. You know, if we're making a Rhone varietal, maybe this is the Syrah. Right. I have no idea. A bit more more vetter, I'd say. A bit. It's kind of a funkiness to the to the end of the nose, which is really appealing to me. So, you know, I will add that, again, microbiologically speaking, there aren't other organisms at play. This doesn't go through a malactic fermentation. It doesn't have, you know, Brettanomyces like we talked about before. Or at least if it does, it's in so low level that it doesn't manifest itself. So what, you are, what you're experiencing is beer and the barrel expression and some age because this, this particular uh, bottle has been both in the barrel for 14, you know, 14 months, but right. I mean, the bottle itself has been sitting for the better part of a year. Would you say it is, is more difficult or easier to fashion a beer such as this than, say, a, an IPA? Well, there's a learning curve. I mean, I'm certainly more comfortable making IPAs because I've been doing it day do. in, day out every, right. you know, but there's a certain challenge, and I... That's why we, again, that's why we tapped the winemakers, because there were elements to this that were completely foreign. How to handle a barrel, and then how to deal with blending barrels together. Because, mm. you know, to my palate, if I go barrel to barrel, I mean, there's enough variation between the barrels that it starts to frighten me, and how I'm going to try to produce something that I can right. count on. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's, that's our world for a, to a large part. All right, let's move on. We've got a little bucket down here. Go for it. You go first. <laughs> I hate to throw it away, but we'll make some 16, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the next beer we're going to try is Parabola. And, uh, yeah, I remember so liking this one. I love these labels. This is actually the second batch that we brewed. Um, what I love about these labels is we give some of the really important statistics on the label. And it guides the consumer to know what to expect. But... Parabola was... This is that Germanness in you again. Right? <laughs> in, information in all brewers, on the label. Brewers, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Parabola is, is our original recipe Russian Imperial Stout. And Russian Imperial Stouts are very strong in alcohol. They're very girthy in their malt bill and, and, and residual sugars. Very high hopping rates. I mean, it's pretty much everything amped up that you could possibly want in a beer. So would I be... Pours like mortar oil a little bit. Would I be mistaken to say that the Rasputin Imperial Stout is kind of a benchmark American Absolutely. Imperial Stout? Absolutely. It's one of my favorite beers. Yeah. yeah. No, it's one of, the ins- for one of the inspirations in for, for sure. And, you know, just like everything in modern American brewing, you know, I, I find Rasputin to have a very high drinkability. It and does. And when it's poured yeah. on draft nitro, I mean, I can sit all night and drink that beer even though it's a little higher strength. The tendency in our industry is to take everything to 11 and, and really kind of maybe sometimes go too far. And again, oh, back to barrels. In our industry too. Is it? So out of stainless, this beer and, and the Bravo Brown as well is kind of hot. It's almost unmanageable. It's not something that's very pleasant to drink. There's a lot of esters that are just kind of too high and pointed. And the barrel tends to completely round out those sharp edges, and it takes what could have been a, a difficult beer to drink uh, a whole pint of and kind of mellows it all out and it almost makes it, uh, again, you know, just easier to drink, a little more um, pleasant. Yeah, it's beautiful. And, I mean, it's definitely bigger than like the rest of it's a It's a burly beer for sure. And if you pour it in the glass and, and let, set it aside, almost like a decanter, Five minutes later, it's even more pleasant. You know, a little bit of the... Again, I mean, there's your connection with wine a little bit too. Same thing, most of the wines, you let them sit for a while, they they get better and better in the glass, and it's really good fun. This is really nice. I like this a lot. And this again, bourbon barrels, or is this in something else? Yeah, this is bourbon barrels as well. Now, we do infuse some rye whiskey barrels, some wheat whiskey barrels, Mm -hmm. even some brandy barrels, but the majority of what we're using is bourbon, and most of what you're getting from the oak expression is from the bourbon barrels. Now this beer obviously, again, back to raw materials, has yeah. a large amount of the roasted barley to give it its black color. And roasted barley is roasted in a kiln that's, that looks almost identical to a coffee kiln. 
So if you can imagine, it's just like a coffee bean. It has a lot of the same mm -hmm. characteristics, some of that nice roastiness. And there are different producers around the world that have different techniques to create different flavors. So the other thing that this beer has going in out of the brew house is a really high hopping rate. Really? And we, we rate hop bitterness on a scale of zero to 100. And it's actually a measurement of parts per million iso alpha acids in solution. I know too much math. The other cool thing about the barrel is this went into the barrel somewhere between 80 and 100 IBUs and comes out of the barrel lower on that scale and a bitterness that's a little more approachable. So instead of just whacking your palate with you know, mouth puckering bitterness, it really works kind of this integration concept that brewers really don't you know, learn in school. Like what right. happens when you mix a couple things and let them stay together for a while and things. Suppose is, is that all that hasn't happened sooner? It is a bit, isn't it? Because it's happened in wine and I mean spirits, they blend a little bit, I believe. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what great role. And I've, I've sat in on the blending on all but one of these anniversary beers and it is really, really interesting. But you, you start with such solid raw materials. Like you have these these two are two of ten, and everything, as I remember, on that table was was pretty dramatic. Yeah, and and the other thing that happens when we bring the winemakers in and we start going through these, you know, there are there are certain components that we've made new beers like Hel Dorado this last year. Hel Dorado. Um, Hel Dorado. We have to give them fanciful names. Yes. That's where Velvet Merkin started. You know, yeah. it, was, it was just this name that was going to stay back at the brewery and. It, Somehow I think out. we went into that in quite some depth in our last interview <laughs> thing here. And it went on after the, the video was turned off. But I think that if you sat brewers down and gave them these two beers to blend with, they would tend to go heavy on the parabola because for whatever reason, brewers are attracted to high hopping rates, intensity. Mm. You know, a lot of beer aficionados are really into intensity. They want to hurt <laughs> mm -hmm. after they taste something. Winemakers are the opposite. They want, you know, they're looking for integration. They're looking for round drinkability. And that's the thing the winemakers have brought to this blending program um, that I don't think we would have been able to have. During otherwise. one of the blendings, I, I played that game. I did two different ones. I left out this particular beer and tried to go with the some of the lighter style beers. I mean, none of them were light, but you had lighter style mm -hmm. beers there. They weren't so black. And both made really, really pretty, pretty brews. And again, it's like making a wine. We just blended it for our winery. And you sit down and you have a, a group of different blends and you have to look and go, okay, these are all nice, but you have to ultimately, and this is your job, regardless of how many winemakers you have in the room is, what am I trying to end up with? What's, what's my end goal? Which, what style and what feeling, which is hard for, for 10, for example, when you didn't know what you were looking for. Just going for finding which blend worked for you. It's, that's exciting, I think. Well, we've now done this for six years and we've never given the, the, the winemakers uh, an end goal. We've just said, I thought you were make... gonna say any money. <laughs> well, we didn't give any money. <laughs> <laughs> but we've never said, you know, this is our target or this is where we're trying to go with this. And maybe the program will develop to that because I think as we go along here, we could taste through these and we will realize that there's, a, you know, there's a theme that we're kind of moving along. Yeah. And maybe we need to kind of shift this thing a little bit. Cool. Let's move on to the next, uh, the Union Jack, I think, with Double Jack. Ha, ha, ha. 